It's Mike, your host of Get the Word, an etymology podcast for word nerds. We'll talk about the history and origin of words in English. If you're coming over from the English sessions, well, then I'll give you an even bigger welcome, loyal listener. Get the Word, an etymology podcast for word nerds, available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. Hello there. I'm Colleen. I'm Anders. And I'm Daniel. We're three nerds that met through our love of science fiction and fantasy storytelling. Of course, one of our favorites is George Lucas's signature achievement, Star Wars. And if there's one thing the internet definitely doesn't have enough of, it's nerds talking about Star Wars. So here we are with yet another Star Wars podcast, where each week we discuss one of the films in the current Star Wars canon. From the sands of Tatooine to the levels of Coruscant, we cover it all. Yet another Star Wars podcast is available wherever you get your podcast and is part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Ladies and gentlemen, please notice that exits are conveniently located at the front and rear of this auditorium. When leaving the theater, we suggest that the exit at the front of the auditorium will allow you easier access to the parking areas. Thank you. Baba! Nothing. You done? <laughs> <laughs> story elements, Butler. Story is a great thing. about is what we're doing. You're telling there me a, a story, great story here. I, here. I don't. I'm like, oh, you're, you're done. <laughs> you're done. He hasn't. Let, he's still leaping, but he's not home yet. Right? Just, they just need to do the episode before everyone dies. Ziggy. <laughs> so when he has sex with them, <laughs> they bang. The mics are hot. Mics are hot. Uh-huh. Get it. This summer, <laughs> <laughs> the boys have forgotten cinema calendar. It comes up. Wow, oh, I, I'd do it. That's fine. <laughs> as long as they're tastefully done. <laughs> uh, no. Oh, all right. Well, I guess we're still doing it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler, and you're listening to the Forgotten Cinema Podcast. Each episode, we highlight a film that, for a variety of reasons, was forgotten by audiences. Whether it's because a more popular movie was released at the same time, or maybe the movie simply didn't catch on with an audience in its initial run. We'll discuss what we love about the movie, or perhaps don't love about it, but we'll always recommend you revisit it. If you enjoy our podcast, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast right now. It could be Spotify, it could be Apple, it could be Amazon Music, it could be anywhere. Wherever you're listening, we're there. And that's all I got. You did some ad libbing at the I end. I did there. because I because I remember I liked when we did our Forgotten Summer one. We were like, check out our backlog of 100 episodes, and I'm like, why didn't we include that in the generic opening? But we'll be, next time, next time, rewrite it. Rewrite. We'll have to remake that, much like our movie this week, which is a remake, it's, retelling. I would say it's an adaptation. Oh, excuse me. Although my synopsis says it's a retelling. Retelling adaptation networks. What are we doing this week, Butler? We're doing Scotland, PA, a 2001 film. A thinly veiled retro modern version of Shakespeare's Macbeth. It takes place at a burger diner in a small Pennsylvania town, complete with foreshadowing soothsayers, weirdly campy acting and pace, even a 1970s self-awareness cornucopia. A black comedy of errors, some trailer park trash, kill their boss and steal not only his money, but also his idea to have a drive through window installed. After they get the money, they then buy the doomed restaurant from the owner's sons that they don't really want any part of. A nosy vegetarian sheriff then begins hanging around. As first a homeless man whom the couple has framed can't be pinned with the crime, and the older brother is suspected, the couple squirms as the damning evidence stacks against the older son had a uh, sucky relationship with his father and no alibi. That could be the worst synopsis. They're all really done. bad synopsis. That, like, just be like, hey, did you ever see Macbeth? All right, it's hold that. on. Well, let me redo it again. We're doing 2001 Scotland, PA, which is, all right, so here's the synopsis. It's Macbeth, right? but replaced like castles and kingdoms with uh, basically uh, McDonald's and set it in 1970s joints, yep. Pennsylvania. 1975. Rural Pennsylvania. Oh, does it say 1975? It does, yeah. That's, right. yeah. But that's, yes, you're out correct. This is a retelling, a remake, a adaptation of the Shakespeare uh, play Macbeth. So for those who are familiar with Macbeth, you probably will know about what we're talking about. For those who are not familiar with Macbeth... You never went to school. Well, that's terrible. Oh, that. come on. My. We'll, we'll guide you along our way. <laughs> Butler being the resident Shakespearean authority here for Forgotten Cinema, I'm sure he'll help us out. What what is that like? my official title? I like that. I'm all right. That's your new, uh, that's your new lo- logo. That's your new <laughs> label. So Scotland, PA has a runtime of 104 minutes. It's rated R. 
I could not find a production budget, so I don't know. I got nothing for you there. That's a big N slash A. I was going to say it's got like no production budget, and then they redo Macbeth's, and it looks like they put a lot of money into doing that. So I couldn't tell you. I, yeah. I, I couldn't find it. I looked, but I guess that's a darkly uh, hidden secret that we'll never find out. Uh, release date was Friday, February 8th, 2002. This movie did come out in 2001. Oh, at, in the Sundance Film Festival, it's a Sundance movie that was, you know, attracted quite a lot of people. They, they you know, that's why it got picked up, and but it didn't get released in 2002, February 8th, as I said, opening week, and it did forty three thousand dollars. And then domestic, worldwide, are both the same. It totaled a whopping three hundred eighty four thousand dollars. Nice, a lot of uh, lots of lots of money there. They paid for that M that they have stuck in the front of that uh, that restaurant. <laughs> exactly. Production company was Abandoned Pictures. It's distributed by Lot 47 Films. Like I said, it came out on the 8th of February, 2002. It went up against the Arnold Schwarzenegger fighting terrorist collateral damage. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the remake of Rollerball called Rollerball with Chris, uh, Chris Klein. Another, another eh. Aren't you doing that? On, uh, I am. Comics? So that, I, I don't know. Whenever this episode comes out, uh, I'm doing a triple t episode with pine of comics it's what it's basically a ripoff of what the forgotten cinema brand is <laughs> uh, quite frankly no i'm just kidding it is but um so we he asked me what to do we, we chose rollerball which means i gotta watch the original and this one so i've yet to record that episode as you listen to this as we record this but as you listen i've probably already have done that episode and it maybe is already out so yes look for it at uh, pine of comics uh big fat liar as well and then in the bedroom uh which is a movie that i like quite a bit and I believe Nick Stahl and Marissa Tomei. Uh, so the 15th of February, you had Peter Pan 2, Return to Neverland. I've never seen that. Oh. John Q with Denzel Washington. Nice. Hearts War that's with Bruce Willis. Hey. Crossroads with Britney Spears. And then Super Troopers with the Broken Lizard troop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a big Super Troopers guy. I know a lot of people love it. It's funny, but. There's stuff that the Super Trooper stuff is, there's stuff that's funny. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't say that I'm like all in. Right. Yeah. Uh, February 1st, which is the week before you had slackers, not, um, I was confusing it with slacker from Richard Linkletter, but this is slackers. And if you ever watched this trailer, Butler, it's with Devin Sawa. Uh, Oh, I know what this is. Yeah. 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 I watched the trailer and I'm like, Oh boy, there are about, there's about, (laughs) four or five moments in the trailer i'm going that ain't gonna fly today (laughs) so if you're looking for some inappropriateness in the 90s or in the early 2000s check out slackers and then you also had birthday girl that was the same week so not a lot going on it's february as we say you know february is kind of a dump month a little bit especially back then Uh, your probably biggest film there is collateral damage they all the other movies they probably didn't know what they were going to do with or if they were going to make any money well collateral damage itself was delayed from uh September, I believe. It is definitely not Arnold's strongest film. Yeah. Uh, this is movie is written and directed by Billy Morissette. Uh, I do not know if he's related to Alanis Morissette. I do know that he was married to Maura Tierney uh, when they did this movie because they were husband and wife. God, so that's, that's why Maura Tierney is probably in this movie. She makes out with, the, uh, with Macbeth a lot. <laughs> well, that's acting, man. I know. <laughs> it's like every scene I want you just humping his bones, baby. Just grind his bones. That's, you, you're an actor. You know that that's what I, goes on. I know. All right. So it's just weird. <laughs> this, is, this is his only film that he directed. He's more of an actor and he's been in movies like Pump Up the Volume. He's also in the TV show Girls and the TV show Man About You for a couple episodes, uh, as well as Girls, a couple episodes there. He's his only writing. Other writing credit is My Dead Boyfriend, which is actually directed by Anthony Edwards. It stars Heather oh. Graham. Yeah, I know. It came out like five years ago. As we said before, this is based on the, or not based on, it's an adaptation of the Macbeth play, which is also written by William Shakespeare, for those who don't know. And William Shakespeare is famous for writing and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> cinematography by Wally Pfister, who I believe is Christopher Nolan's personal cinematographer now because he has won an Oscar for Inception and he was nominated for an Oscar for The Dark Knight, The Prestige, and Batman Begins. And he pretty much does most of Nolan's films, if not all. Composer was Anton Sanko, who has done Party Girl, The Possession, and Ouija, or Ouija. Edited by Adam Lichtenstein, who has primarily worked in TV uh, in terms of editing. He's done the Key and Peele series show, uh, AP Bio, and The Hills. And then produced by Richard Shepard and Jonathan Stern. 
Shepard is more of a director than I guess this is maybe is one of you know very few credits in terms of producing, but he has directed the movie Dom Hemingway that stars uh, Jude Law, The Matador, and he's also directed a bunch of shows, a bunch of episodes for the TV show The Handmaid's Tale. Jonathan Stern has produced uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, The Return, that's on TV, Ooh. the movie The Ten, and the TV show Children's Hospital. I think you get a lot of credits for Children's Hospital. So you had James LaGrosse or LaGro, LaGro probably, right? James LaGro as yeah. Joe Mac Macbeth. Everyone calls him Mac. Uh, he is in Drugstore Cowboy. He was the original Point Break. And more recently, he's on the TV show for a couple episodes, The Mosquito Coast. That's on Apple Plus. More Tierney, like I said before, she plays Pat Macbeth, uh, the wife of Mac Macbeth. <laughs> she is in the TV show News Radio, TV show ER, and then the movie Baby Mama, to name a few. Christopher Walken as Lieutenant McDuff. Nominated for an Oscar for Catch Me If You Can. He actually won an Oscar for The Deer Hunter, and he's in the movie Hairspray, which he's actually pretty good in. Kevin Corrigan as Anthony Banco Banconi. He is in True Romance, Kiss of Death, and Slums of Beverly Hills. Uh, James Redborn. I apologize if I said that wrong. Uh, he actually passed away in 2014. He plays Norm Duncan, the owner of the original Duncan's. What is it called? Duncan? Just Duncan's, right? It's just called Duncan's, Duncan's yeah. He's an ID4. He plays the uh, sniveling uh, Mr. Nimzicki. Secretary of State. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, you are fired. Something like that. He can't. He can't. He can't do that. Yeah. He's well, he just. Uh, <laughs> he just did. He's also on my cousin Vizzy, Vinny. Where again, he's the you know not so nice guy. He's also in Sense of a Woman. Where again, he's not the nice guy. Uh, Tom Geary as Malcolm Duncan. He's in the. He's actually Smalls from The Sandlot. If he looks familiar, everyone. <laughs> he's also in U five seven one. He plays the one that that you know drowns when he saves everyone's life. He's also in Mystic River. Amy Smart as Stacy. These now these are the hippies or the delusions that Macbeth has. These, these are what would be the witches in yes. the original play. So it's Amy Smart as Stacy as hippie number one. She's in Crank, Just Friends, in the TV show Stargirl, which that's more recent. Timothy, this guy's name is Timothy Speed Levitch. Like that's his nickname, Speed, and that's actually his stage name. He plays Hector or Hippie Number Two. Uh, he's on the TV show Stroker and Hoop. Andy Dick as Jesse or Hippie Number Three. He's from the TV show News Radio, in the Army Now, and Inspector Gadget. And then finally, Josh Pay or Pass. I apologize if I said that wrong. Plays Douglas McKenna. He's in Joker, Scream Three, and The Station Agent. All right. So you have never seen this film. I have not ever right. seen this film. And no, I know I you seen. like, you're a big Shakespeare guy, right? Yeah. I, I, well, actually, let everyone, I mean, <laughs> why don't you I mean, right the before audience, recording let, this, I just performed Shakespeare. Let's, let the audience know your relationship with Mr. Shakespeare. Well, like most people, it started in middle school with like Romeo and Juliet and Midsummer's Night Dream. That's not like most Which, people, but go ahead. I, I, did, I did not. Oh, really? No. Most middle schools now, that's what they start with. Uh, and I was not a fan. I don't like Midsummer's Night Dream, and I really don't like Romeo and uh, Juliet that much. Um, but then in high school, we did like you did Hamlet, you did Macbeth, you did some of the the juicier stuff. Actually, we did not do Hamlet in my school, but we did Macbeth and a couple of other things. And I started really getting interested in the history stuff, and the dialogue, and then you know what you can do with the adaptations of Macbeth. We watched a couple of cool movies like um, Roman Polanski's Macbeth, which okay. was really good, and. Um, you know, I, when I decided to be an actor, we went to co I went to college, and that was a lot of learning how to be an actor was studying the, the plays of Shakespeare. We bought a tome, which I still have. It's got all the plays, all of his soliloquies. And literally I've taken five or six classes where I have had to analyze, read, write papers on, perform every, uh, every sh play Shakespeare has ever done um, or written. So I am intimately, <laughs> I have intimate knowledge of Shakespeare, like ingrained in my brain. Um, and I have performed Mark Anthony in Julius Caesar in a traveling show uh, I have played in Hamlet. I have played in The Tempest, which I'm not a big fan of, and a couple of other roles as well. But, you know, okay. I'm pretty big on the on the Shakespeare game. All right. So then w when you watched this movie, what was your initial reaction? It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Macbeth is one of my fa is my favorite of uh, Shakespeare plays. It's like my dream role. I have not gotten to play Macbeth yet. So that's that's definitely one of my 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 acting goals. Right. Um. And I mean, it tells the story decent enough, but I think it's also really dumb. What to the, the point where, like, okay, not the story, but like every like the whole the characters and stuff. I get they're trying to be goofy and it's a, a dark comedy, but I think that kind of ruins some of the Macbethiness of it all. Okay. Um. Yeah, 
it, I, I really don't have much of an opinion of it either way in terms of, well, that's not going to fly, fly for the podcast. podcast cause I didn't, are. I didn't hate it, <laughs> but I wasn't really, I, I didn't really like it. And I didn't think a lot of the jokes landed. So I think it could have been taken. It could have taken itself a little bit more seriously. And I think that would have been funnier if it tried to be more serious about fast food. Okay. Like um, I think that one of the things that I, one of my initial reactions to this movie was that it had a very, even the nineties indie feel to it. So even though this movie it's cause it's low budget. Right. Uh, but you do have a lot of, of, you know, I guess I, I'm trying to remember how popular everyone was at this moment in their careers. I mean, Moritz Uni was on ER at this point, right? I don't know when news radio ended. It, it probably was right around that time. But James O'Groh was in Drugstore Cowboy. His, you know, his popularity started in the early 80s. So he was working, you know, even like Kevin Corrigan, like all these people, Christopher Walken, who'll just, you know, he'll do anything. With, right. With, you know, with good I mean, reason. I think Christopher Walken is your, how you sell it at Sundance. Right. But, uh, you know, I think that it, it, it's got, it's got people in there and it, it just has this 90s indie feel where it's dark. And there's humor, there's serious, but it's not too much. It's just, it's rough. It's, it's, you know, dirty. I always appreciate a film that isn't afraid to look, you know, gritty. That's one of the things I do really like about it because we talked about one of the other films we did last season that was a indie film, uh, The Baxter. Yep. How it looked like crap because it's an indie film. This, I feel like knows what it's going to look like, but it uses that grit, that, that kind of crappiness to make it look like a more ground it in that 70s kind of feel to it. It makes it look like a 70s film, which I liked. Well, the Baxter is also modern times, but it's in New York City. So you don't have a lot of you're forced to shoot where you can shoot. Uh, you don't have a lot of leeway in terms of set design, set decoration. And so you, so if the Baxter was set in the 70s, it, right. maybe you could get away with that with this because it's in the 70s that's what i'm yeah. saying yeah i yeah. think that was a good idea to set it in the 70s i mean this isn't shot in pennsylvania this is actually shot in halifax i think it's shot in canada um so you know that probably helped as well kind of like off the beaten path and you probably have uh places that are you know in disrepute that you can use but right. like even like you had said before we started this you know even though, or maybe you said it while we're, while we're talking, you did say, well, excuse me. You had said this when I was bringing up the budget that when they rebuild Macbeth's, uh, it, it looks nice. I mean, it's all retro cause you're and that's something right, I appreciate, yeah. but it looks, you know, it looks nice and it looks, you're like, wow, they, they, that's a pretty big sign. Yeah. They built a fast food restaurant. Right. Right. And what's cool about it is it's in the seventies. So you're, you're, you're getting all these like retro, like this new retro stuff that's in there that we're all familiar with. But the whole idea is the whole thing that sets them off is that Duncan comes up with the idea for a drive through, which Mac already had. And then he, you know, he realized that it, it was a little weird because it's not like he stole it from Mac. They had the same idea. They had the, really same the same idea at the same, same time, time. But then it was so the the inclination to kill Duncan. And I, I get it. I know it's Macbeth. So, you so know, you, you have to it, give like I get reason, that. Right. It didn't really it would have made sense if Duncan stole it from Mac or Mac gave it to him and then he, he was going to go 50 50 and he turned his back on him. But again, that's not Macbeth. So maybe you can't do that. Right. If you give him more of a reason to kill, see, I don't, I don't know if I like, I like the idea of the drive through being this new thing, but having that impetus other than taking over the store is not what Macbeth's only impetus in the original play was taking over. The fact that if he kills Duncan, he's going to be king. Well, and the store is, telling, is supposed to be right. there is his domain. Is the domain. Yeah. So, but not about drive through or stealing any ideas. It's just, right. I want that store. Right. So when it starts and he takes over, you know, as a manager, because he sets the other guy up for stealing money, which he was actually stealing. I thought that was just the next progression, the next step. So I thought Pat, um, la AKA Lady Macbeth was just going to tell him now kill Duncan, mm -hmm. which he does, but it's because he steal he has that idea of the drive through and mm -hmm. it could be it's supposed to be your idea, Mac. And he also, yeah, he also has the idea for basically what is chicken McNuggets. Yeah. And the like Duncan chicken pieces. Is a yeah. stupid idea. Yeah. I really like the, uh, the line when they're do, talking about the drive through and he goes, do you talk to him? You ask him in one window and you go, no, there's an intercom. Yeah. You don't need the, you don't need the booth. You yeah. don't need the booth. It's wired from the board to another. And he's just saying it like he can see it in his head. Yeah. I really, I liked that scene a lot, but then like that makes Macbeth seem smart and inspired and have a reason to do everything. But then most of the movie, he's an absolute dunce see i don't i think he's just 
I mean, because it's following the storyline of Macbeth. So he is falling into delusion. He starts off by running into the, the three witches or the three hippies. So he's clearly already having, you know, delusions and he's already having visions. Uh, so he's already kind of heading down that way. Right. I'm okay with him going crazy. Right. But he's also a moron. So well, I think that's just because that's what he looks like. Well, like he, that's the look on his face. Well, he's also play. You know, I think he play. He's p- yeah. uh, purposely a moron in this, and I think it's to give Lady Macbeth more power over him. But I think the fact that they're making out all the time and they're super in love—that's the power she wields over him. I never, you never get in any of the plays that Macbeth is, uh, you know, dumb. He's just his reasons for wanting more are just to please his tyrannical wife, basically the mm-hmm. wife who always wants more until she comes to regret it. Well, more tyranny is the best thing in this movie. Yes, uh, and, for sure. and maybe that's just because she has a juicier character, uh, you know. But she's she's the one that shines out of this film. Even I always remember, even uh, back when I first saw it, I, I was just like, "Wow!" She, you know, I think I watched it because she was in it because I love news radio so much. Right. That's probably why I watched it. And then I was I always like you know when they retell or adapt you know, an older story into modern times, well, somewhat modern times, you know, I right. always, always like that. Um, you know, I, I love the, the Richard the third with Ian McKellen when they're in like, you know, that 1930s British. Yeah. I love that one. So like stuff like that, like I'm always interested in like, kind of like, you know, reimagining of the, of, of the Shakespeare storylines. So that's probably what brought me to the beginning, but she, oh, she just getting back to a more turning point. She is just really, really good as Macbeth, or Lady Macbeth or Pat Macbeth. Um, you know, I love the stuff when she's flipping out, obviously of, uh, of the, the spot, which was, is the burn. Yeah. I found that to be really, really clever. Yeah. I really liked that. Oh, with the, the she burns her hand yep. in the fryer oil when they first kill Duncan. And from then on, even after it heals, she still thinks she sees the spot and is rubbing mm-hmm. ointment on it. I thought that was really, really good. Now, I'm not super familiar with the play, so bear with me. Sure. But the friends of Mac, the the guy who owns a tanning salon, which is an awesome name when a tan loves a woman. <laughs> I uh, that was good. And, he, and I love and his, his, son. his son with the, yeah, <laughs> the they, they, they all have the, the shell necklace or that white necklace. So are those friends, like, are, are they as, a, not, they're not a big part in this story. I know Banco is obviously a, a big part, but right. the other friends, are they a big part in the play? Um, they're in his court. I mean, obviously Banco is Banquo in the play. Right. right. Uh, and he has, uh, children, one of which escapes. So the whole prophecy for the witches is that Banquo's kids are going to inherit the Scottish throne. Uh, Banquo actually also sees these witches, you know, Macbeth isn't just imagining them. Okay. They are real. Uh, and, but Banquo never acts on these, these things because Duncan is a good person. He's a good man. And, uh, the other people in his court help to murder, uh, Macduff's kids. They do mention that Macbeth is going to go after Macduff's kids. Macduff has, you know, a wife and kids. Uh, in the actual play, Macbeth sends people out to murder Macduff's kids, which would be probably the other people in his court or the people he goes hunting with his sure. hunting party. Basically, he does kill Banquo, but he also kills, tries to kill Banquo's kids who escapes. And then uh, it's rumored that some people think, even though you never see that person again, that eventually down the line he becomes king of Scotland as well, fulfilling the witch's prophecy. Now, in this one, it's more like Mac is trying to get away with it. He's setting people up. He sets up the uh, Andy, the drifter, the 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 bum. That's he little, sets up he the sets bum. He sets him up. Yeah. He tries to. He tries to set up Malcolm. <clears throat> right. He does, so. It, it it seems in this one, he's more trying to just get away with it. In Macbeth, it's obviously just he doesn't really care, right? Uh, he's also trying to get away with He's okay. trying to silence anybody who might know. Right. So like Banquo knows because Banquo's with the witches. So he's got to get rid of Banquo because Banquo starts to kind of feel guilty. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so does Macbeth. He does start to imagine. He feels way more guilt once he kills Banquo, who was his friend. Um, but yeah, Macbeth does try to get away with it, but he doesn't try to set anybody up. He just, Duncan's dead. Now I'm the king. Do you like the fact that the wit- the hippies are only seen by Mac mm-hmm. as whereas you say in the play that the witches are seen by other people? Uh, no, I, I would prefer them to be real. Right. Only because mm-hmm. at the beginning, if he sees them before he goes crazy or has a guilty conscience, it doesn't make sense because mm-hmm. um, he's, he's supposed to have gone crazy after he kills Duncan and that's supposed to weigh really heavy on him. But in the beginning of the movie... It starts off with the guy walking past the the Ferris, the Ferris wheel, wheel right. and they drop their food and then they're talking. And the, so that gives me the indication that they're real. But then when 
Mac is walking towards the end of the second to last time he sees him, not when they're on the roof, when he's trying to kill McDuff. Um, the second to last time he sees them when he's out in the field and he turns around, they're, they're right there. And the, the, the Ferris was right there. Right. Yeah. So I didn't understand whether the carnival was not real or it was real. Why you have that guy in the beginning walking across? Or are you just trying to like, you know, trick us? I, I didn't understand that whole aspect. I don't get it either. That's, that's, <laughs> it does, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff with the witches that I was like, uh, okay. Well, do you not like, cause I actually like this movie probably a little bit more than you do. Is that because of the Macbeth connections that you're not, you're not digging? I just want, I want more Macbeth and I want the jokes not to be so, so, so doofy. Um, because I think if it was taken more seriously, the fact that it's all about a burger joint is ridiculous. Really? You don't try like this that? Hard. No, I, I like that. And I think if it was taken more seriously. The fact that they are trying to just take over a burger joint would just the ridiculous situation would be funny. Uh, they also so many wasted opportunities in terms of lines that they could use. Um, some of which are just done through Christopher Walken or uh, McDuff's self-help tapes. Yep. Like tomorrow and tomorrow's yesterday, like all that kind of stuff is done through the hypnos hypnosis tapes. And they can use some of that dialogue a little bit more clever throughout the, the film. But some of the use of Macbeth is, is clever. Like I said, the spot is really good. The hunting trip that he takes with Banquo, even though in the play, Macduff, uh, Macbeth never goes with Banco or Banquo. <clears throat> like some of the some of the things that kind of set everything up, the fact that Malcolm doesn't want uh, the burger joint. Right. The play, Malcolm is very unsure of himself and doesn't take the throne right away, which is what allows Macbeth to take over until Macduff helps to try to seat uh, Malcolm back on the throne. Right. So there's stuff like that that I do like. Donald likes, you know, Joe Willie Namath. <laughs> <laughs> He's a he's a he's a friend. I mean, it's like I know why Donald's in there, but if you didn't have because he's in the play, right? If you didn't have Donald in there, Donald Bain. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think it's needed. You know I mean like I didn't like his arc is it, it's okay. He he's he's not athletic. He's obviously gay. You know, he's in there just to make gay jokes. I, I, and I wasn't. Well, a big where, fan well of where's that. the where's the jokes though? Because I couldn't. It's just a situation. Just, uh, just, he's, he's there. He's effeminate. <laughs> yeah, that's well. And I was like, this isn't one of my notes. Is like, uh, cool. Gay, gays are well, gays are weird. All it's right. I don't. That's what you're going I didn't, with. See, I didn't get. I didn't get it. Like being like, I I got I what I got out of it was the obtuse nature of his father not realizing that his son was not interested in football. Right. And it's so evident that he wasn't in, like, you know what I mean? Like well, his, even Malcolm says it to him when they're arguing the first time in his room. What's he say? Uh, that Donald doesn't even like football. Yeah. He does it because you want him. Well, every boy likes football. But you, know, but you never get the idea. But see, I never got the idea that Malcolm, it, like Malcolm didn't understand it. Like that he didn't know what his oh, brother was I think Malcolm absolutely Malcolm knew knows. and it yeah. didn't care because right. he was like, this is my friend Chris. He's like, okay. Like, it's just like, it was like, I don't care. Like it was like that. So I didn't, right. I didn't get the jokes at their expense. I just got, I thought that more of the joke was more on the father, Duncan, just not being, not understanding his own son. But they kept doing it even after, afterward, like McDuff goes and they're singing. And, well, and I think that's just to give him, see at that point, I think it's just, there's no arc stuff. for him in the movie. So it's just to give him something that's to just do. Like, then we have to watch it and like, that's why you just don't have them, them in the movie. Kind of be, yeah, I just cut it out. Yeah, just, just have Malcolm. Yeah. Just, there's no reason for because you never even again you don't you don't want to look too too much into it, but you never even have the idea that you know who's taking care of these kids. Like you know you know they're all like oh we're pretty rich we're getting our well, money. Malcolm said or Donald says he'll probably go live with the neighbors right. until after he graduates this year. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so they do kind of talk about that, and then they have money, but they're not they're I don't know how. Uh, it's called they have a quote unquote shit ton of money. Yeah, I, I don't know. I <laughs> Malcolm guess says we have a shit ton of money. Life insurance. I would imagine life insurance and the fact that you don't really know much about it, but Duncan did really well selling donuts first. Donuts was his thing. Yeah. And no one believed that when he opened a burger joint, it would do as well. Is that because we're supposed to believe it's Duncan Donuts? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> so he sold Duncan Donuts and then, okay, okay. Maybe, maybe you're supposed to. That's I didn't the make joke. that connection. Well, like Morissette worked at a uh, I don't know, Dairy Queen. He worked at a Dairy Queen in South Windsor. In Connecticut, I believe it's South Windsor, where he that's where he kind of got this idea of nice because he was into, he was into Shakespeare, he was into reading all that stuff, and kind of he envisioned it within in the fast food world. Is that why uh, they're obsessed with making that making sure the cones are right and dipping the cones? Maybe, <laughs> like, I, if this movie had money, 
like I, I think you could probably go further, deeper into the fast food kind of kingdom uh, idea aspect of it, rather sure. than just keeping in in a, a, a small town. You could probably get a little bit more grandiose with it, but I think probably the budget kind of dictated it being in a small town. Which again, right. I, I I don't mind. I like the atmosphere. I like the setting. Well, if you take it out of a small town, I think you make it more about a, like more of a corporate theme, right? Than a personal like family business theme, which I think they were going with. You could you could maybe yeah yeah. But it's a different, yeah. You put I, a different could, aspect on it. It would be, yeah. it would be probably a little bit more bigger. It would be like more like boardroom stuff. Yes. More, yeah. More like the founder almost with the Michael Keaton, that style. Mm -hmm. The founder is a great film for those who haven't seen it. Um, you could, I mean, you could absolutely do, I mean, you can put any Shakespeare play within any time period or setting, mm -hmm. but you could absolutely do like a, a boardroom Macbeth easily. Mm -hmm. But I think that this was trying to go for that kind of family business mm -hmm. aspect to it. Yeah, I I think maybe I like this movie a lot more than you do. Um, it's not perfect. It's not um, it's not like you know, oh my god. You, you, but I would recommend this movie to people if they're looking for a, a good film. I I like the fact that it's it, it's it's almost like this has become a, a a staple now. Where I like it that it's not like everything else. Like I like it that it's not marvel i like it that it's not you know the usual norm which, well that's interesting because last week we did bad times which isn't like the usual movie and you yeah. hated it because of that i told you why i think yeah, i i thought i that. i know because <laughs> i i because i why are you making me argue bad times again <laughs> because i took I, I just thought the style was in there to be styled because it was like oh you know it'll be wicked cool if we do this and it's like oh i'm like yeah that will be wicked cool but like, what about the story? Like, this this has the benefit of being based on exactly. something. Exactly. This, this you're right. This is, this is a cheat. You're, this <laughs> isn't a cheat. No, they take a story that's hundreds of years old and then they kind of butcher it. <laughs> if you're an indie filmmaker and you want to do a, a great story and that's in the public domain, hey, welcome to William Shakespeare. Oh, I don't disagree for sure. Then I, that, I, have, I hold none of that against these people. Why well, I wouldn't say it's original or unique. Do you prefer this? Or do you prefer Much Ado About Nothing that Joss Whedon did where they're in modern times and they're speaking Shakespearean well, dialogue? Hey, I already told you I don't like my, Oh, no, I, did, I said Midsummer. I don't really care for Much Ado About Nothing. I'm, I'm not talking about the but, play. I'm talking yes, about no, that no, style. I don't, I don't like that. Thank you. I don't like that. I don't like something that's updated for the modern day, but we don't, we don't bother to update the, the dialogue. Just do it back in the day. I'm okay with doing the old dialogue, but I don't think that they did anything clever about it. They just... Did yeah, that's day. what I'm saying. Yeah. That's why this this but is I'm something cool that's like a little bit more clever. The Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio, I, I like that, which mm -hmm. uses the old speech and takes place in modern day, but it's stylized. It's different. It's yeah, unique. I got you. Right, but but you so you think that with this one it was you didn't like the tone. It shifts back and forth too much for you, uh, whereas it's you know you want it to be either. Straight kind of straight comedy, but a little bit more funny or a little bit more dark rather than you think the mix isn't right. Right. I think it goes into dark comedy and then goes back into goofy too much. Right. I think I think personally, if it was a little bit more of a dark comedy, it would work better. And that's I think what I love about Pat's stuff, more, more tyranny stuff, is it her scenes are very dark comedy. Um, any scene that she's in toward the end with Mac are also getting to that kind of dark comedy kind of aspect where he you think I'm dumb. And he's starting to go crazy and he's, he's going, he went from dim-witted to just kind of like kind of scary. Well, that moment when he tells her he's going to take care of it. Right. I'm going to take like, care yeah. of it. I got it. I'm going to take care of you. I got everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, no, no. Like, I like that. I like when he's drunk and he's, he's talking to uh, Macduff trying to, I'm going to make you a drink with a vegetable in it <laughs> and olives and fruit. <laughs> and it's not very uh, nutritious. <laughs> well, when she find, when she realizes or she kind of uh, fears that he is talking about killing Banco. Going just completely off the deep end. And yeah. she doesn't, under, and you know, she's, but she's dealing with her own stuff because her hand is burning and, you know, the, yeah. uh, you know, the ointment and she's trying to get the ointment and like, there's nothing wrong, obviously, because she's just, it's her... Uh, it's guilt. guilt, yeah, yeah, and that's why Macbeth sees Banco at the end as well because it's his guilt. They yeah. both have the guilt for what they've done. Yeah, 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 no, 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 absolutely. yeah. yeah. I still, I still like this movie. Uh, it's got moments that are good. I don't not like it. I just, I'm not really digging it. I would still recommend this to people. I think some parts of it are an interesting take. I just think that it could have been done better. Even with the budget and stuff like that, I just think it could be a little bit more Macbethy. I think it could be a little darker comedy kind of wise. I prefer I think I prefer that in my indie 
indie movies is dark comedy. So but, are you yeah. saying that you would not prefer to go see the 2019 musical adaptation that was off Broadway for this movie? Of Scotland, PA? Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd watch that. Because okay. that's going full goofy. I guess I'm in. Musical? I mean, I, I saw that. I was like, interesting. Interesting. So did you notice that the oven mitt that Pat has on uh, towards the end, because that's when she chops off her hand, Ooh. has the same tartan as Macbeth, the clan Macbeth? Oh, I, no, I did yeah. not notice yeah, that. I didn't the same. pay attention to it. I, I mean, noticed that there's a really gross shot when they zoom up and she's all bloody. Oh, the when the blood's, still on the, the blood's coming off. Yeah. I, I thought that was a great that shot. That blood is like... Thick. chunky too yeah. yeah exactly i was like ooh, well she must have hit one of those uh uh major arteries in her hand oh man well she, she had to die, and then yeah. you see her her eyes flicker and then she just passed out but she's also pleased because she finally got rid of it does because uh, does, how does macbeth macbeth die in the play uh he is he impaled in a, he dies in a sword fight yeah with okay Macduff. okay so yeah so i figured no i knew they fought yeah i just didn't remember i didn't know i didn't know the significance of the bullhorn or the uh steer uh, on the on his uh, car because that's right. what he falls on and gets impaled. I didn't know if that was. I just don't remember the play too much. Right. Uh, I Lady Macbeth though falls from a tower, so she doesn't cut off her hand. I am almost. I mean, I'd have to, I haven't read it in years, but I am pretty sure she falls. But I, I like that version of her. I think. Oh, cutting I, off I, her I hand love cutting works off her hand. Yes, better. It's I mean, really good. interesting. I, I don't like, I, I don't want to come off. I don't know a lot of Shakespeare. So I know, uh, you know, I've read it, but I haven't studied it and right. whatnot. So um, I don't want to say anything that's not really true or accurate. But I know that I thought that the cutting off the hand was part of the play. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. What's also interesting is in the end of Macbeth, they seat Malcolm on the throne. Yeah. In this, Macduff takes over and makes it a vegetable restaurant, <laughs> which I'd eat at. <laughs> no one else is eating there. Why not? I don't it's know. Good vegetarian. It's good stuff. I'm a vegetarian for those who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I just thought that was weird because it doesn't follow the story either. Because I figured, you know, you see Malcolm and Donald come back up to the restaurant and they're looking down at Macbeth. I figured, okay, they're gonna be like, "This is our family's business. Let me take over." I think I figured there would be something with Malcolm finally coming and seeing the Macbeth name over the restaurant when he thought that they were gonna keep the name Duncan's. And there really wasn't any of that. There was no impetus for Malcolm to want to take back his throne, which was a big part of the original uh, play. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, he didn't care. And then he goes back and I didn't, I didn't really, I don't know if I bought him going back because he's just so angry at his father, the whole maybe first half hour of the movie. Sure. And, and, he, and then he goes to perform for his, with his band or rehearse or whatever. And he feels guilty about the fight he was in. Yeah. Uh, and then he goes, I didn't really understand the impetus to go back, but I, it's obviously there to, to cause to suspicion upon him later on. Cause he, yeah, they passed by the Macbeths driving by. Right. But I mean, it kind of works to Malcolm's indecision and how he is in the play. He's like wavering and it's, it's his kingdom to have. So again, him going back and apologizing to his father is him kind of unquitting yeah. in a way and being like, I'm sorry I did that. All right. And then losing his kingdom again. But he's not, I mean, you're modern retelling. There's no way really for you to give back Macbeth to him because he's already sold it. So he's not getting that. Malcolm's not going to get that back. So there's really, you know That's what I mean? True, there's yeah. really no way you, you yeah, I know this is. Well, he's that. got a shit ton of, quote, again, a quote unquote shit ton yeah, of but money. Why would he want to get property. back into the business? He probably wants nothing to do with it. It's I mean, family's again, business. But, but you also have Macduff who also comes in and you first meet him and he's like, He's envious of the He's people that work of in the restaurant burgers, industry, stuff right? Like that. So, uh, I, your job's very important. You're feeding people, you're feeding their souls. I mean, in an adaptation and in a retelling, you have to be able to be flexible on and, and what you should or should not include because you just can't. It doesn't make any sense for the story. So, I think that I was okay with that change, just because it's within the story that's being told in Scotland, PA, not Macbeth. Well, I'm sorry, but the story of Scotland, PA is the story of Macbeth. It's not like Psycho, where Psycho, the Gus Van Sant Psycho, was a shot for shot remake. Oh, that was just complete, yeah. I mean, it's not like that. It's still, you still can add your own flair to it, your own, your, it, your it, own. It's a burger place in the 70s. Got, <laughs> it's still got to follow the story. I mean, I wasn't that upset by it. Yeah. Honest. I'm yeah. just, I'm just kind of saying stuff, but no, I mean, I thought it was all right. One of the moments I really like in the movie is when they are sitting down in the. Uh, Macbeth store, the Macbeth diner, 
and they've got that slow dollying on them and they've got that music going. And then she's surprised by Richard or Robert, or she doesn't know his name. And she's like, fuck, fuck, fuck. Oh, right. right, Yeah. yeah. Uh, I thought that when they're sitting there, it's just like, I thought that was a really nice move, a camera move. Uh, That is a dolly in everyone. Um, uh, When they go in on them, I thought that was a nice moment. Oh, sure. I liked the transition from the restaurant into the, yep. when they're going from the rest diner into the actual fast food store and they kind of change. Yep. Showed the change of the whole restaurant. I thought that was cool. Yep. Really well done. Um, I also like that Pat's hair gets a little bit more gray as the she story has goes the, on. The, the, she has like the uh, streaks going down. She's got white streaks going yeah. down the side of her head at first and then they start to really fill in over the top yeah. until she's got like a kind of a skunk thing going on. I thought that was really clever to show like the stress of what she's going through and all that. Right, right. <clears throat> and that's it. And that's all I thought. <laughs> All right, so I mean, I know I, we've kind of talked about it already and danced around it, but I guess maybe let's make it official, Bowler. Why do you think this is forgotten? Because <laughs> it's not very good. No, oh, I'm just joking. It's it's not that bad. Um, I think the stars have faded on a lot of these actors. Although Christopher Walken is still Christopher Walken. Um, no one's going to see a James Legro movie, uh, unfortunately, or a more Tierney film or a Kevin Corrigan film. As much as I like Kevin Corrigan. Um, well, they're not, I get what you're saying that they're not leads per se, although you can make a case for more tyranny being a lead, but they're not leads per se, but they're still all quality actors. So they may oh, not be oh, going sure. to a movie for these people, but I'm saying any, any more. Oh, you, why it was forgotten back then? Why it was overlooked back oh, then? Oh, no, it's, it was an independent no, film no, 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 back no. then. Yeah. Well, you could do both back then and now that's right. fine. Now you're not going to it because it's, it's 20 years old. It's got actors that aren't exactly names anymore you know er is gone come on now christopher walken is still christopher walken but he's much older show some respect to the people that came before you come on <laughs> uh, i'm sorry let me go to the next uh i have to get to the next timothy speed levich movie no one's coming oh that's not fair i'm sorry <laughs> like but that's the truth that's why it's it's kind of if if this had bigger names and it was older i think people would go back to it I mean, I didn't even know about this movie, man. I, I'm a fan of Shakespeare, and I, I don't really know about this movie. It's just not in the cultural zeitgeist because it was probably overlooked well, back then. We're putting well. it in the zeitgeist. Right. Well, so, like, I, you okay. knew about it, and you told me yeah. about it, but you're also very much into film. Yes. And independent film. Yes. Most people who don't have access to somebody like you aren't, aren't going to find out about it. <laughs> hey, man, film. you all have access yeah. to me. Although it is on Amazon Prime. I'm surprised it's on Amazon Prime. This seems like it would be more difficult. Because it's not a well. 90s film. Because if it was in the 90s, it would be disappeared. But because it's, <laughs> because it's, it's one or two years yeah, removed, we yeah. can actually find it. Well, why do you think it was forgotten back then, then? I don't know, actually. Because yeah. Maura Tierney was coming off of... Uh, she was probably in ER at this time. Like you said, News Radio. Christopher Walken. Billy Corrigan. Amy Smart. As much as I hate to say it. Andy Dick. They were all big in the cultural zeitgeist at that point. And it's it's weird that this movie didn't do better because it's fun. It, it's, I, I can't imagine. I didn't watch the trailer, but I can't imagine you can't mix a pretty good trailer. It was a Sundance darling. Uh, it, it totally fits that time period. I, I don't know why it didn't take off. So she was in ER when this was out going. Okay. Yeah. She joined ER in 99. Uh, so that's so she's uh, like two or three years into. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause ER, ER went for a while. So yeah, she was on ER. She had come from news radio, which was up till 99. It was 95 to 99, then 99 to 2008. She was in ER. So yeah, so she was, she was in the, she was, yeah, yeah, exactly. Her, her name probably got this movie money as well. Not just, not just walking. walking right. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't make sense that I, I don't know why this movie didn't do better. I don't then. know. I think I saw this film in the theaters and it wasn't in a lot of theaters. It's, it's, I, so that 43,000 that I said opening weekend, it was in maybe like 16 theaters to start. and never really got higher than that. Is this when you were in New York? No, I was in the city uh, from the summer of 98. Uh, okay. So no, but I wouldn't have gone to the city. I did not go to the city to see this, but I'm, I am in, we are near Fairfield County and Fairfield County in Connecticut usually gets the same films that'll just come out in the city. Okay. You'll usually get, so I might've seen it in one of those art house theaters in Fairfield, but I'm pretty sure either I watched this in the theater that, cause that's, I, it has to be, I mean, who knows, but yeah. So it wasn't in a lot of theaters. So I can, it, it's, it's already starting off 
uh, on, a, on a bad note. Yeah. It's right. a Sundance darling. It's a Sundance film. And a lot of films that go to Sundance, you do hear about a small selection of the ones that are, that make it, that are purchased that are out there. But a lot of the ones that are purchased, you don't ever hear from because they just don't translate. And people just are, are just buying up stuff, or buying up properties and buying up movies that they're taking a chance on, you know? And that's kind of why the model of indie filmmaking has been, you know, make it on your own dime. Hopefully you'll sell it to a bigger, you know, right, bigger yeah. name, which stinks because it's like, well, do you want good quality, good product or not? But Hey, what are you going to do? Uh, it's just, it's just the way it is. People don't want to, the uh, studios don't want to spend money. Uh, I guess in that way, they'd rather just toss 180 to 250 million on a big tentpole movie and drop a hundred million to promote it and then get, get all the money back internationally. So that's right. That's how, that's how, that's how it works right now. You make your own low budget horror movie for $200,000 and then they sell it and they make $8 million. Right. That's listen, we're not complaining. That's just the way the business is. And that's just how it's running right now. Um, if you can find a way to work around that and make your own stuff, do it, uh, and do it well. So, (laughs) yeah. So I mean, it's, it's, I, I still, as much as I know the stuff that you didn't like about it, um, I think this is worth people watching. I th- I would definitely recommend this movie. I'm glad it's available on Amazon Prime. Um, if you like Shakespeare or if you don't like Shakespeare because you can't ever get around the 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 language. dialogue or the language, right? It's like this is a movie that you should watch because it's you it's speaking your language and and, and but it's using uh the storyline, the plot device, the plot lines from Macbeth. So it's kind of a way to be introduced to Shakespeare without at, you know whereas a lot of people stumbling box are the dialogue and, and how it's written right um so i think i think in in that sense i think that's nice I, I actually think it's to be honest with you i think it's a really good idea just to take maybe like four or five like to do a series of these movies set them in modern times update the dialogue keep them low budget but just churn them out boom 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 in terms of an indie production, indie film house, you know, you know what I mean? Sure. I think, I think that's a really smart thing to do. I think, I think adapting or doing older material that's in the public domain that, you know, we watch a bunch of shows that are in the public domain for best ever channels. Right. And for best classics ever, the portal there that are good, are really good, but they're in the public domain for just a variety of reasons. Stuff's right. in the public domain because the, the patent has run out for so a lot of stuff. Do it. Right. Right. But it's a great, these things aren't, they're not in the public domain because they're not good. They're in the public domain because it's a patent run out or they're just available. It's like, go do them, remake them, redo them. There's these worked before they'll work again. You just have to update them. So right. I don't disagree. I would like to have seen more of the classic dialogue redone. I, I think they see, kind of just gotcha. do their own thing. Sure. Um, but no, I would have enjoyed like a, like different versions of like, I was Kind of disappointed there wasn't, is this a dagger I see before me Mm -hmm. Um, speech when he's about to kill Duncan and he sees the ghost dagger. I was waiting for him to really talk about like the pan he's holding. That would have been good. I remember cooking a burger in this pan. I remember this was a great pan, but it looks like it's got blood on it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, there's that, like it's missing classic scenes like that. And the tomorrow scene is just a hypnotist tape instead of him learning about, he learns his wife dies in the play and goes on from there because he's just stuck as king. And in this, she kills herself and he dies. At they the kind of time. both have their own arcs that are go, that are ending they go separate. The yeah. Time. Yeah. No, that's fine. I mean, maybe it's more of a metaphorical death where he's going off on his own because he's basically, they are not together for the last 20 minutes of the movie. They definitely have like a so different opinion. So maybe yeah. it's, maybe it's a different style of death kind of thing, but those are all, those are good notes. And that's, that's, uh, I can understand that. But I would, if this had more of that, I would probably like it better. But like you said, that is a good idea to do that. Sure. Update the exact dialogue, but modern. So we recommend it. I recommend it. Check it out if you can. Scotland, PA. Mike, what about us? Oh, we were Forgotten Cinema. Uh, you know that because you're listening to us. You can find us wherever you find podcasts. Make sure you go to ForgottenCinemaPodcast.com. Check us out there. Check out all the other Forgotten Entertainment shows as well. Uh, you can also find us uh, on the social medias at Forgotten Cinema Pod or Forgotten Cinema, depending on where you are. We post awesome commercials every Thursday. At least we think they're awesome because we're <laughs> self-centered. Uh, so check those out. Um, and... Uh, yeah, check us out our other shows as well. We got Row Eight, uh, where we are on Row Eight on we're on YouTube for that as well, right? Uh, so the show's called Now Renting, and now it's renting. It's, it's, a, it's brought to you by Row Eight dot com, and they're a, a streaming service, a video on demand service. It's just movies, and basically we take one movie a week, we talk about it, and Mike and I each give three things that we think you should rent it on Row Eight, and there's a little button there that you click on it that kind of gets us a little 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 scratch, a little money. That's uh, right. And so if you're interested in that, we, we're trying to promote that a little bit now. 
Uh, but that's that there's a there's a page on roweight.com, roweight.com backslash forgotten cinema. Uh, and you can get all of our videos there. That's right. Yep. And we're also uh, we do a show for best ever classics or best, best ever, ever channels. channels. Uh, uh, we're called the matinee where we go over like field said uh, shows that have, yeah. you know, mostly rights free, but there, older yeah, films that best classics ever is the channel. And they, uh, they do like, uh, like my man, Godfrey, my favorite brunette. Uh, what was the John Wayne movie we did? Angel and the bad Angel man. And the bad man. So we, we, yeah, we just, what well, we, it's kind of an abbreviated version of what we do here. We but it's on video. So you get to see us talking about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. You get to see us in our awesome editing techniques. <laughs> 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 so yeah, catch those out. Um, and you can also join us next week as we'll be, co- we're actually going to the eighties Butler for a suggestion from somebody, you know, oh, yeah. Do I know this person? You do know this person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we are doing running on empty from 1988. That was suggested to the show by Mr. Butler's fiance. fiance. I don't, I don't ever know what to say. <laughs> uh, this is the first time she's had a show or. Her suggestion on she's made up multiple suggestions and I've said no, but no, no, no. <laughs> she has had multiple suggestions. We just never took one until now. Did I pick this one or did you pick this one? No, I picked Scotland. So you picked this I one. I picked this yeah. one. Um, we, but this is one I think you know, and I've never seen it. You've never seen this. I've never seen this. I know she's a big fan it's, of it. It's it's I've I saw it, but I'm not I have remember very, very little about it. So this is probably another you know, revisit where I'm like, okay, let's see what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> so who knows? Who knows how we'll come out? And that's it. running on empty. I said it. No, you did not. Yes, I did. I did said you? running on empty from 1988. Oh, did you? Yeah. I know you said it was 1988. Listen, I don't remember. Listen, I know what I'm doing. Listen, I'll know I, when I edit it. I know what I'm doing. I don't listen to you until I do the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I'm Mike Field. I'm Mike Butler. And this has been Forgotten Cinema. Hey there, I'm Mr. Black. And I'm Mr. Green. And we're a couple of guys who met in a comic book store. Together we host the Pint O' Comics podcast, where we invite listeners to join us to talk about movies, TV, comics, music, or just whatever. Starting very soon, we'll be joining up with the fine folks at Forgotten Entertainment, for a special limited series called On the QT, where we talk Tarantino. Every week for 10 weeks, a guest will join us to chat about every Quentin Tarantino movie from Reservoir Dogs to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So join us starting in May 2021. On the QT is available wherever you download your podcasts and is part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Ooh, that's a bingo.